Good evening, everyone. Uh, it is now 535. Uh, I will uh, call the meeting to order. Uh, prior to this in our work session, we've determined that we do have a quorum with Babs DeLay, John Uwinoski, Robert Hyde, Kenton Peters, myself, and Michael Abrahamson. Um, the uh, first order of business, I need to read this, uh, the, uh, the virtual uh, meeting determination. Uh, uh, I'm Mike Villa, uh, Chairman of the Historic Landmark Commission, hereby determine that with the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic conditions existing in Salt Lake City, including but not limited to the elevated number of cases, that meeting at an anchor location presents a substantial risk to the health and safety of those who would be present. Uh, let's move please now to the approval of the minutes from the previous meeting. And I would ask for a motion from the commissioners. I'll make a motion to approve the minutes from the, what was it, February 3rd meeting? Correct. Thank I'll you, Captain. Very good. Let's have a roll call. Um, let's see here. Uh, Babs? Babs, you're on mute. I'm sorry, why are we having a roll call when you just said who was here? No, it's not a roll call. This is for approval of the previous meeting minutes. I see. Okay, I'm confused. Um, I approve, so approve. John? I'll abstain. I wasn't there. All right. Uh, Robert? Um, aye. Kenton? Aye. And uh, uh, Michael uh, Abramson? Aye. Very good. Approved as, as noted. Uh, next, let's move to a report from either the chair or the vice chair. As chair, I do not have a report uh, this evening. Babs, is, do you have a report by any chance? I'm seeing her shake her head, so I think that's a no. Uh, next, let's move to a report from the director. I do have a couple things to report on. One is that we've reviewed um, some commissioner applications um, on the particularly on the west side of Salt Lake City and we forwarded one outstanding candidate to the mayor's office and the mayor's office is reviewing that application at the moment if they decide to mon uh, to nominate this applicant it will move on to city council and they'll schedule an interview just like they did for you all and and make that appointment so we'll keep you up to date on that um I also wanted to let you know, perhaps you recall some of you, um, a text amendment for carriage houses within the overlay that was presented to you in 2020. Um, you forwarded a negative recommendation to the planning commission and that item did sit for a while with the applicant Stephen Pace and it was heard by the planning commission recently and it was to allow more density and reconstruction of a carriage house on a particular property it was really site specific um, the planning commission provided a negative recommendation to city council on that text amendment. So I just wanted to update you on that, um, mostly based on the code that was provided or proposed being unenforceable as drafted. The other item that I wanted to talk about is the mask mandate being lifted. And I anticipate that our next meeting will actually be at the city county building um, in person. There is a possibility that we'll have a hybrid option. We're just trying to work out staffing and our ability. If there is an ability or expectation to have a hybrid meeting. Will we um, have dinner? That would include dinner. We will have dinner again. Oh boy. Yay. <laughs> so, so Michaela, is that a uh, hybrid for, for the public? Or public well, and, and commissioners? If we have a hybrid option, it would be for anyone, public okay. staff or commissioners. Very good. 
And that's really all I have to report. Thank you. Very good, Michaela. Thank you. Uh, now let's have, excuse me, let's have general public comments uh, concerning items that are not on the agenda this evening. Uh, are there any public comments this evening? Did Cindy have a public comment? I'm not monitoring the email. Yeah, Cindy had a public comment that she wanted to make during the general section of the meeting, okay. so she'll need to be unmuted. Hi, Cindy, caller and user two. Hi. Hi there. This is really bizarre, but my thanks to Aubrey for figuring out how to do this. Um, <laughs> So I'm speaking to the issue of the interface between the Pioneer Park vision plan, which is on your work session, and the cultural landscapes report, which you heard at your last meeting. There has been a briefing at the city council about this vision plan already at a work session, which I did observe. Um, so there's not been a public hearing yet on either the cultural landscapes report for Pioneer Park or the vision plan, although there's been a tremendous effort for public input on the vision plan. My concern is the lack of integration between the two. Uh, the cultural landscapes report was under construction while the public process was going on for the vision plan. It began last summer um, and has um, some incredible visuals you may have looked at on the website. Um, I'm requesting a public hearing and integration, further integration of the cultural landscapes report into the vision plan, which um, I, I frankly don't see in um, the pathways, the walkways through um, the space. Um, it's evident in the perimeter planning, but that is ubiquitous in Salt Lake City um, to have a block ringed with trees. Um, there's also not your territory, but um, a lack of a comprehensive budget um, looking at all the parks and their needs in the city, some of them historic and some of them not. Um, but I would ask for an opportunity for the public to comment. I don't expect many people to comment on the cultural landscapes report besides myself, but there has not been an opportunity for that to occur. Um, I don't know whether it's going to be adopted or um, the, you know, I don't, I don't know what's going to happen to the cultural landscapes report, but I'm, my message is that I don't see it as fully integrated into the vision plan for Pioneer Park. Thanks very much. Thank you, Cindy. Are there any other public comments or emails? Um, there's Larry Campbell as his hand up. Larry, did you want to make a public a general comment to the commission, sir? Um, not, no, not right now. Okay. Okay. I'm sorry that I, I clicked on the wrong button. <laughs> That's okay. Which item did you want to speak to? No, we were gonna we we're gonna talk about the uh, certificate of appropriateness on three sixty five Elizabeth. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. Perfect. We'll call on you then. Thanks, Michaela. He's actually the um, the applicant, just under a different name. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Perfect. And we don't have any over in the panelist list. <laughs> we don't have any emails um, for general comments at this time. All right, very good. Thank you, Amy. So let's go ahead and close the, the general public comments and let's move to the public hearings. Uh, we have two cases this evening. Uh, let's, let me introduce the first one. It's a minor alteration of a painted brick at approximately 365 South Elizabeth Street. Uh, the case number on that is PLN HLC 2022-00118. And the planner who will be speaking to that is uh, Sarah Jeboronik. Did I fracture your name too terribly? If I did, I, I apologize. No, that was great. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, let me go ahead and share my screen. Hold on just a second. Thank you. Um, 
This is a request for a painted brick on the property at 365 South Elizabeth Street. The property is located in the University Historic District on Elizabeth, which is a mid-block street that runs north-south between 1100 East and 1200 East. This review is an enforcement case as the brick was repainted in 2020, and the enforcement case was initiated in December 2021. This is a photo of the front facade of the building that was taken in February of this year. And then a Google Street View photo taken in February of 2020 that shows the brick as unpainted. Um, Salt Lake County Archives provided this photo um, from 1939 that shows the building with painted brick. And then this is a photo from a 1980 survey that also shows the brick is painted and it was designated as contributing in this survey. There are later photos that are available from the county assessor, likely from the mid 1990s, that also show the brick is unpainted and the property owner and representative report that it was unpainted at the time it was purchased approximately 20 years ago. Planning staff visited the site and met with the owner and his representative, and they stated that a contractor recommended painting the brick to address the deterioration of the masonry. Um, you can see on the photo on the left an area where the brick is falling and the paint is coming off. And then on the right, there is some deterioration visible under the brick. And then you can also see areas where the mortar was repaired. And then the applicable standards of review for this project are in 21A 34020G and then in chapter two of the design guidelines, which is, um, addresses building materials. And based on the peeling of the paint, um, less than two years after it's painting, and then also the swelling of the brick, staff's opinion is that the removal of the paint would exacerbate these existing issues. And then an inspection of the dwelling showed that there are some underlying concerns with the masonry and the mortar. And in fact, opinion, the removal of the paint includes, including using gentle methods is likely to exacerbate the existing issues that may have been caused or themselves exacerbated by the previous paint removal. And so um, given these issues, staff's recommendation is that the Historic Landmark Commission approve the painted masonry on the building with a condition included in the staff report that a breathable paint is used in future repainting. And that concludes the staff presentation. Are there questions for staff at this point? The applicant is also here and has a statement to make. Very good. Oh, can you hear us? Uh, yes. Okay. Yeah, we just want, I'm, I'm Greg Bowling and I'm a representative of Larry Campbell's. He just asked me to give a brief statement. I think Sarah pretty much, you know, handled everything correctly that Larry had bought the property in 2003. It was a bank owned property and it was in very bad repair, disrepair. And over the years, he has gone to uh, numerous times, had it, the, the brick repointed. Um, and then it finally got to that point in 2020 where he brought in a contractor to look at it and the advice and the re recommendation was to go ahead and have it painted. Now, at that point in time, he had been told that it that the paint that was being used was a breathable paint. So whether or not that is the truth, uh, yeah, I don't know that. I can't say one way or another on that. But over the years, the, the, the whole point was that he's tried to upgrade it and the building to make, you know, to keep the integrity of the building etc and, and keep it in good repair um and and it just got to that point like i said a couple of years ago where he actually had to do something about it he did not cause the problem it was a problem that that it was actually from you know numerous owners prior to it where they'd been painted stripped etc i can tell you that when looking at the brick it was it was really pitted out and in disrepair spalding uh, almost dust coming off of it, and it to me it looked like it, at some point in time, maybe in the in the late '80s or early '90s, it was at a point where there was a lot of sandblasting of these old buildings that was occurring, and and I'm almost kind of thinking that that may have been the case at that point in time. Um, 
And so at this point where, yeah. Oh, and the other thing was it, it, when he did it, he didn't realize that he needed to pull a permit specifically where you had a brick building that, and if you wanted to paint a brick building that you had to pull a permit for that because he had, had owned another property that in the same district, not too far from there, but it had been painted and, and he had actually repainted it without there being a problem. So there, so there was a lack of knowledge, um, whereas it, in that district, that if it was a, uh, a, a brick facade and you wanted to paint it, you had to, get, you had to pull a permit. So I think that pretty much describes the things. Very well. Okay. Uh, any, oh, very good. Um, are there any questions for, for staff or the applicant? Um, I just want to clarify what. In 2003, when the applicant bought the property, it was not painted, correct? Correct. Uh, do we have any idea as to what year? You're, you're saying maybe the 70s or 80s, it would have been sandblasted? Oh. Okay, I think Sarah had a picture there, Sarah, that uh, showed that it had been painted in the 80s at that time. And then I'm guessing that it was in the 90s. Now, just because I've, I've been in the real estate industry for almost 40 years, but that it, it seemed like recollection was back in the late 80s, early 90s, that that was, they were, uh, there was quite a bit of that going on. Yeah, okay. I, that's helpful. Um, and just for clarification to the oldest photo of the building, it was painted and that was circa 1930s? No, no, 32. 32. Okay. We have one in the 80s that showed it painted as well. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Just a, it's not a question, but I think a clarification. Michaela, when you and I were discussing other matters, uh, the notion of, of painting permit is is not the, the issue. It was a, 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 a certificate of, of, um, of appropriateness. Mm -hmm. That's that was that that was was really the issue because there is no painting permit required within the historic district. Right, it would be the certificate of appropriateness and a lot of times when applicants do come in, maybe they're changing. They're doing some sort of work. Um, maybe they don't know the painting or non painting. Well, they may. They may not know, um, okay. and they might be doing other work that requires a building permit and then building permits flags. The entire project, and then we consult with them and. That's where we can catch a lot of the, the painting situations. Right. Thank, thank you. I just wanted to be clear Thanks. on that. Any other questions or comments for uh, either uh, for the applicant? Uh, hearing none, let's go ahead and open the public hearing. I do not see any hands up. Um, and I do want to remind the folks from Tesla for the next item that I still don't see that I can actually that you'll be able to speak. So if you could work with your audio connection, thanks. I don't see anything. Anything, Amy? No, we don't have any emailed public comments either. All right. Well, thanks. thank you very much, uh, Amy and, and Michaela. Let's go ahead and close the public hearing. Um, Ask the well. There's there's there was nothing to respond to, so I believe at this point, uh, we we should move into uh, into the ex, you know, executive uh, session. Uh, this is a, a discussion with the, this is closed to to the applicant and and the public. So commissioners, any any discussion on this? I can go in in order if you like. It's a no brainer. I'm I'm prepared to make um, a motion. Yeah, I, just, I want to get in the record that we had a very similar case of a few months ago, at, at which point we did discuss pretty um, at length about how um, it 
if the brick was previously painted and then the paint was stripped off and then the brick starts to degrade, this does seem like the the way to go. I mean, it's it's just smart to for the long term preservation and long term ex existential kind of condition of the building to paint it with breathable paint that will prevent the brick from spalling. I, I very much agree with you, John, and in reviewing the 11 items in the uh, analysis of standard for minor alterations, all of the all of the findings were either complies or not applicable. So there wasn't anything that that was in those standards that stood out as as being to the contrary. Commissioners, any other discussion? If not, Ebs, we can can move. Great. Regarding petition PLN HLC 2022-00118, I move to approve uh, this with conditions listed in the staff report based on the findings listed, the information presented, input received during public hearing. I move that HLC approve the request for a certificate of appropriateness for painted brick at 365 South Elizabeth Street as presented in uh, PLC eight PLN HLC twenty twenty two zero zero one one eight with the condition listed in the staff report. Very well, thank you, Babs. Is there a second? A second. Very good. Let me go in order, please, just to for record keeping purposes. Uh, Babs. Uh, aye. Uh, John. Aye. Robert. Aye. Kenton. Aye. And Michael. Aye. Very good. Uh, motion is unanimous and passes as noted. Second item of business that we have this evening is the minor alteration for a solar uh, roof at approximately 365 North Center Street. Uh, it has a, a case number of PLN HLC 2021. Uh, dash 01240, and I believe uh, Nan Larson, you are presenting this for, for the city. Thank you, Terry. I'm just sharing my screen right now. Okay, I think that's the right screen. So this is a request for a minor alteration to install Tesla solar glass on a historic structure the existing asphalt structure is proposed to be uh, completely removed and replaced with uh, Tesla solar glass. The site is located at approximately 365 North Center Street, and it's a single family house that's contributing to the Capitol Hill Local Historic District. And staff has found that the proposed minor alteration meets the standards of compliance and is recommending that the Historic Landmark Commission approve the request. Uh, Tesla Solar Glass is an ener a solar energy system that replaces the entire existing shingle material. The uh, photovoltaic uh, shingles will be visually identical to the dummy shingles that are uh, not solar capable. The entire roof material will appear as the same. The replacement material will be glass that lays flat to the roof structure and will not alter the slope or type of roof structure. Uh, an accompanying uh, home battery backup and shutdown um, switch is proposed to be installed as well. The backup, um, the backup battery is proposed to be installed near the rear facade of the house and will not be visible from the street. The historic structure appears to be in good condition uh, the installation of the Tesla solar glass will not damage the existing structure and will not alter the building or roof form. So really the only noticeable dif difference is a change in material. Uh, one item to consider um, as uh, the Landmark Commission makes its determination is um, the previous approval uh, that they made last year um, where uh, the Landmark Commission approved a minor alteration request uh, for Tesla solar glass on the roof of a single family house that was also contributing to the Avenues uh, local historic district. This property is located at 740 North, or excuse me, 740 East 3rd Avenue um, in the Avenues local historic district. 
And the images on the screen are the previous asphalt shingle and the finished Tesla solar glass material installation. So while it's a completely different project, it's uh, something to consider is uh, there's an example in a local historic district of um, the solar glass being installed and completed. So again, um, staff is recommending that the Historic Landmark Commission approve the minor alteration request. And I'm happy to answer any questions the commission can have. And I do believe um, Audrey war was able to include the applicants as panelists. So I believe they're av available to speak as well. Very good, just in order. Uh, commissioners, do you have any questions for now? Uh, do we know what the historic roofing was like based off Sanborns or tax files or anything? Was it cedar no. shake or was it? You know, I was not able to find that information um, with the research that I did. Uh, I can't be, I know it was an asphalt shingle, um, certainly, but I, I can't say for certain the type of material it was. Okay. Thanks. Very good. Any other questions? If not, let's uh, hear from the applicant, please. You, applicants, you can mute and unmute yourself. I can go ahead and do that too. Chris, did you want to speak to this item? Or Carlton? Uh, I'll unmute both of you. Uh, I can go to the original um, shingle. Is that, sorry, I kind of cut out a little bit there for a minute. Um, I don't know what the original was. I believe Carlton might know this too. I believe the previous that we replaced was asphalt shingle though. During our survey, we found that, uh, as shown in the photos before, it's just asphalt shingles. Um, what was original to the house, I can't speak to that. Um, if there's any other questions about the product, I could answer, but I can't answer anything in regards to the home itself. All right. Uh, is there any other comments that the applicant would like to make? I don't have any unless Chris does. All right. Oh, okay. Very good. Chris. Um, nothing to add that I think wasn't already presented uh, unless you guys have any further questions. Uh, I do not commissioners. Any questions for the applicant? Will it be pretty much similar in a, in final appearance to the 1 on 3rd Avenue? Almost identical to it. Um, there'll be minor changes, um, but for your eyes, um, yes, it'll be identical. Okay, thanks. I I just had had one question just to verify. I I remember this case that happened last year, and I was was a little bit concerned about uh, stair stepping at at the uh, at the corners or the joints or you know where the roof turned the the uh, uh, turned direction. Um, I was very, very pleased with the, I, I did drive by the, the other house uh, on third. Um, it looks good. And, you know, I, I like, and I saw in, in, in your application, the, um, there was a series of, of blanks that made up the difference uh, between, you know, the edges and, and the solar panels themselves. So it's, it, I, I was pleased to see. So I'm, I'm, I'm assuming that that's exactly the way uh, this applicant this application will be done as well, correct? That, that's correct. Everything will be identical. Um, there's one minor change in the valley um, that you will see um, where there will be a, kind of a standing seam style um, just in the valley, but it'll all, other than that, will look identical to one you've already seen. Standing seam, uh, will it be the black color or, or is it, it will be black color? Um, all I it's kind of hard to describe, but it's uh, it's going to be raised up a hair because the the panels themselves don't fit, fit uh, flush to the roof, they're raised up about an inch, inch and a half. So in the valley, 
you will see um, the transition between the glass going um, flush to the roof to um, a metal strip going down. Um, and that it'll look kind of like a standing scene, like metal bit going down. Um, if you'd like me to provide a picture of one, I can. Um, I just don't have the ability to do that offhand. Understood. Commissioners, any other questions for the applicant? Oh, yeah, I have a question. Um, this is Michael. Um, on the, the application on 3rd Avenue, uh, the smaller roof over top of the entry, this sort of porch area, isn't um, the solar glass, uh, which I think is fine in that case because of the distance between the, you know, the overall roof and, and that one. But in, in the case that we're looking at now, um, because of the proximity, is there a plan to apply the solar glass up, uh, on top of the um, uh, sort of entry shed roof? Or, or not, I, it wasn't clear in the report. Who had the, uh, who was able to bring up the overhead view of the product? I could probably speak better if that was able to get brought back up. I just don't have this. I think Nan um, can top, pop it up for you. Would you mind, Nan, please? Um, so were you speaking about, uh, which portion of the roof were you, uh, wanting to speak on? I'm MP9 speaking about MP1 or? and MP2. Um, so those are just too small of, uh, portions to put solar glass on. Um, those tiles that you, that you can see outlined on MP, um, six and I think five, um, you can see the outlines there and those portions on MP1 and MP2 are just too small. What materials are you going to use there? I'm, I'm assuming it'll be uh, asphalt shingles. Um, no, we'll be using dummy tiles, um, which are glass as well. Um, and they are the dummy tiles are indistinguishable from the ones that have PV inside of them. OK, so it, they'll they'll appear virtually the same as, as the, the solar. I, uh, identical. Very good. Commissioners, any other questions for the applicant? Uh, hearing none. Let's uh, let's open the public hearing uh, for for this application. I do not have any hands up, Mr. Chair. Very well. Uh, so uh, there's no rebuttal, and so um, let's uh, let's now move into executive session. First off, I need to formally close the public hearing and then move into executive session, please. Commissioners, discussion? I was just down in St. George for the um, um, parade of homes down there, and thank goodness people are starting to do solar roof and solar tiles. The It was interesting to see you can have them as like if you were in santa fe and the clay tiles that are kind of rounded that are traditional mm -hmm. they make them in that they make them to look like um asphalt shingles they make them to look like um wood shingles and the pricing though is still very high it was like the average was fifty five thousand dollars for a two thousand square foot roof so i'm i'm hoping we'll see more of it but more so that the price has come down on this i'm, I'm glad someone has read is doing this it's certainly very expensive and I certainly would support them in this in this journey. Thank you, Bob's. Uh, I guess Please. my only comment, I wasn't I wasn't um, a, on the commission when you approved the previous installation on 3rd Avenue, but I live right around the corner from it and I probably walked past that house 100 times and hadn't even noticed it. Um, so, like it, you know, that's a, a, a rigging endorsement, I guess. That you know, this is um, unless you're paying special attention, um, relatively indistinguishable from from. Uh, I, you know, Michael, I, I will say that uh, when the when the panels are are first installed, it's just like like when you have a new windshield; it's bright and shiny, and then it tempers just a bit. Mm -hmm. And that you know, I, I pass by that house. You know, I guess it was like maybe three or four months after the initial installation, and and it it the shininess was tamped down quite a bit, 
And so, yes, I, I, I agree with you. I, and like I said previously, I was a, a bit concerned uh, that, that the edges would, would look funny. But I think the the, the blanks that that uh, were talked about make up the difference, and it's it's indistinguishable, and uh, it, it it's a nice application. Commissioners, any other comments? Um, a lot of our discussion that last time focused on the fact that um, asphalt shingles themselves are kind of an approximation of um, wood shakes shingles, and so. You know why not have an approximation of a product that actually um, helps out with our environment a little bit and um, is is more productive. So I'm all for it. I couldn't agree, John. And I I also think that uh, as there's more and more want for these, the prices will go down. Like like uh, Babs was talking about. I think when competition gets in, then then the prices will will move down, and that that'll be so much the better. I believe that's that's all of the the uh, comments that the uh, questions or comments from the commissioners. Um, may I may I ask any of the commissioners uh, uh, for a motion, please? Well, Michael, I'll I'll make a motion. I gotta open up that motion sheet, though. I'm a little <laughs> bit uh, a bit behind. Or if another commissioner has the motion sheet open and can find it, just go for it. Uh, meanwhile, I'm just looking. Uh, I have it open. I'm, I'm happy. Okay, to... please. I, I wasn't prepared. Uh, based on this, the discussion, analysis, and findings in the staff report and the input received during the public hearing, I move that the Historic Landmark Commission approve the proposed minor alteration as presented in petition ELNHLC 2021 dash zero one two four zero very good thank you michael may i have a second please i'm prepared to second that motion very good so i, do so. I second very good let us let us uh, vote in order please uh babs you're on mute again babs oh I, I believe that was an aye. I saw a head nod. John? Aye. Robert? Aye. Kenton? Aye. Uh, let's see. Uh, Carlton is out. And Michael? Aye. Very good. I think that was uh, unanimous. Uh, the motion has passed. Uh, next, I believe that takes care of the, uh, uh, the two uh, cases that we had before us this evening. Now let's move into the uh, work session. Bear with me just a second. Let me find my sheet here. This is a work session concerning Pioneer Park Vision Plan Briefing. And um, I will turn the, the time over to Kayla, or excuse me, Katya uh, Pace. Me, did I misunderstand? Is is there someone else from planning presenting this this evening? I have. Go ahead. I... Oh, there she goes. Okay. Ah, oh, very good. Hey. There you are. Okay. I am with the steering committee for the Pioneer Park, but uh, today uh, the presentation will be done by Nancy Monteith and. Cat, um, I'm sorry if uh, yes, and they who needs, the, will, who needs the ball? Okay, that would be both cat and um, mouse and um, Nancy Monty. Thank you. Um, I'm Nancy Monteith. I am the senior landscape architect with the engineering division with Salt Lake City. And I'm here tonight with Kat Moss, the public lands planner from the public lands department. And together we're going to, uh, we have a presentation uh, about the um, public land, or the Pioneer Park vision plan. And we were here just last month to share with you 
uh, the cultural landscape report and um, just wanted to give you a little bit of background on both projects and then we are uh, thankful to be early in the evening so we can have a little bit of time to really get some of your feedback tonight. So Pioneer Park is um, one of Salt Lake City's oldest and most continuously uh, inhabited spaces. And you know what? I'm going to ask if Pat is able to share the presentation. Thanks, Nancy. I don't think I ha quite have capabilities yet, but that would be great. Amazing. Okay. They should be coming your way. Thanks. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry, I'm still figuring I'll go it ahead out. and just start as you while you, oh, and it looks like it's coming up. This is great. Can you see this? You can. Amazing. Okay, thank you. Um so Pioneer Park is one of Salt Lake City's oldest parks and uh, and it's in our vibrant downtown that is changing dramatically and also really densifying and uh, public lands has a goal of really uh, letting Pioneer Park be all that it can be as our own, our major downtown park, a, a vibrant urban green oasis. And uh, city council awarded us funding for new improvements in the park. And one of the things that um, we have grappled with over a number of years with Pioneer Park specifically is that it's a landmark site, yet we had little information regarding um, little information or clear direction on the historic nature of the park and how to properly steward it. So before we hired a planning consultant, we started uh, with a, a historic landscape architect and um, team to develop that CLR, which we presented last last month. Um, and then the planning process started somewhat later, but was somewhat concurrent. So last month, uh, we brought that CLR to you. And what we'll do, just as a quick recap, we can go to the uh, next slide, please. Um, I um, apologize. I'm actually not sure which screen I'm sharing. Am I changing screens right now, Nancy? <laughs> it it just changed to the third slide. So if you want to go to presentation mode, so that it's it's just the uh, it's the largest view that would be helpful. There you go. You see that now? Okay. Thank you. Now, now we have the notes. <laughs> I am so sorry, everybody. <laughs> um, as we shared with you last month, uh, the, the exhaustive site history that we received with the CLR uh, has been incredibly helpful and insightful. And it's great to have that in one place to share uh, with our, our team and with the community at large. There are four periods of significance um, that were identified by the consultants, the indigenous period, the old fort period, Americanization and civic period. And the indigenous period is significant because of uh, the potential um, connection or information for prehistory or history. Um, the old fort is significant because of its associated with events, persons and broad pa patterns of history. Americanization and uh, period is really significant for those broad patterns of history. The Americanization period was the time when parks really were the antidote to the urban environment and a place for people to gather a vibrant public park. And then the civic period is uh, significant for uh, those broad periods of history. Um, next slide, please. Um, just a, a really quick recap. You'll see that mo the more recent plans, particularly yeah. the nineteen the nineteen nineties plan uh, for the RDA is not included in here. That was the um, plan that had the trees in the center and then the building. 
And then also the most recent that you see now is the existing conditions. I think one of the things to uh, remember in all of the um, periods of significance, if you can look at them, they've changed quite a bit over time. There's an era where it's built up in the center with buildings and uses. And then the next phase, the civic period, it's open with a baseball field with perimeter pathways. Um, if you look at what currently remains um, with those existing conditions, it's really the perimeter planting that remains in these entrances at the cardinal directions and at the corners. And so when the consultant did the integrity assessment, they look at location, design, setting, materials, workmanship, feeling, and association. And uh, the significance or the integrity with lo it, Pioneer Park is significant for location because it remains in the same place and it was an important, lo very, uh, uh, the location was important in the initial platting of the city. Um, design with the primary, in the primary cotton continuity of the vegetation with mature trees and perimeter planting. The setting, the setting of a um, bucolic park in the middle of an urban uh, environment, that's how it's uh, significant or retains integrity. And with materials, um, the integrity there is really around the large canopy trees and the predominance of mown turf that remains. And with workmanship, uh, Pioneer Park does not retain any integrity for workmanship. Uh, feeling, it has integrity for the aesthetic uh, expression of the Americanization in the civic period. And then uh, finally with this association, the park is associated with events and people through time. And you can look back at that cultural landscape report that really uh, um, specifically identifies those. Um, the primary treatment goals for the park that were established in the cultural landscape report were preserving the resource that contributes to the significance of Pioneer Park as defined in the report. So those elements like the park entries um, and the perimeter planting, as I said, are the uh, existing features that have persisted through all the periods and since, since the initial time. Um, continue the ongoing use of the park primarily as a green space, limiting the number of structures and amount of hardscape. And then incorporate recommendations on treatment of topography, circulation, vegetation and compatible alterations and additions. And so what we will do is, um, before I turn the time over to Kat, we'll, we'll now present the vision plan and we are presenting it as a response to each one of the treatment recommendations that are organized in um, the, the plan. And what we're hoping is to go through each one of those and have a few minutes for discussion with the commissioners. And what we would like to hear from you tonight is some feedback on um, the vis vision plan at large. And then um, as we walk through those treatment recommendations, and then also any recommendations that we uh, should incorporate or, or consider as we start to develop um, do the design development. One thing uh, to note is we will be doing uh, a phase one. So one portion of the vision plan will be implemented. And we have yet to decide what that scope of work is. But once we get that uh, capital improvement um, through materialization and site layout, so in design development, we'll come back to uh, this group sometime in the fall of 2022 with an official um, application for a major alteration. So now I'll turn uh, the time over to Kat to uh, present portions of the vision plan. Awesome. Thank you so much. And thanks for having us tonight. I really appreciate it. It's great to be back here. Um, so as Nancy kind of mentioned, public lands is proposing improvements to the park so that it can be a vital public park in Salt Lake City's growing and diversifying neighborhood and the region at large. 
Um, the project design is influenced by points of new input from public engagement that we've gathered over the past few months, um, years, and as well as recommendations from the Cultural Landscape Report, which has kind of crafted these um, project guiding principles, which I'll share with you now. And uh, according to these principles, the project team envisions Pioneer Park being the heart of the city, a model for urban ecology, um, to balance neighborhood and regional needs, to be a welcoming space for everyone, um, as well as a safe and a well-maintained space, and then to provide a lasting legacy. And the CLR kind of highlighted, um, like Nancy said, these specific recommendations um, for the park. So I'm just going to kind of briefly touch on each of these elements, how it corresponds with the CLR recommendations, and then how we've kind of addressed that in this vision plan that we're presenting to you tonight. Um, so we're going to start with topography, and um, I'll have Nancy kind of go into what the CLR treatment <laughs> recommendations for that is. So the, the, the CLR had specific recommendations regarded to related to topography, and that is that the site has been generally a flat site, um, and that may, that should be maintained with this uh, sense of preserving the existing sight lines through and across the park, and that um, sort of only modest changes to topography should be considered, and in the um, with the regard to uh, green infrastructure or low impact development, those changes, topographic changes should be as shallow and wide as possible so as not to be a perceptible, perceptible change in topography. So the, the vision plan then kind of takes these recommendations into account um, by retaining the flat topography, maintaining the visual sight lines through and across the park, um, and then it also introduces kind of a garden ribbon that follows the natural topography of this park. And that kind of flows from the northeast corner to the southeast corner, which utilizes the natural slope and the natural topography to kind of direct stormwater um, in a strategic way to planting areas with um, that we're going to incorporate low grow and water wise um, plantings and ornamentals into. So those are kind of the vision plan. Um, topographical considerations. Um, so at this point, we would we would like, based on the cultural landscape report, treatment recommendations, and what we're pro proposing in the vision plan just here, if you all have any comments um, specifically to that topography. <clears throat> comments or concerns or questions, of course, I, as well. I had a, just a, a question on the previous slide, Catherine. Yeah. Uh, is that is that actually a, a structure that ribbon that that passes through there? This so this this also resembles a ribbon, yes. Um, and that's kind of a proposed pavilion, which I'll talk about in a moment. The ribbon here is kind of from number two right here, if you can see, that kind of flows across diagonally down to number three here. So from the northeast to southeast corners, and then we've also kind of incorporated some pollinator gardens over here with a botanical walk to kind of incorporate some of those water wise um, ornamentals. <clears throat> yeah, the site uh, falls 10 feet in elevation from that northeast corner to the southeast corner. So really using that to collect and direct the water to those planting areas that will be um, that are proposed to be with water wise and ad net regionally adaptive. Um, one of the things we did here is that this area of the city also has some challenges with being able to deal with all the stormwater capacity because it's also the neighborhood is really flat and it's so heavily developed that anything that we can do to uh, mitigate even our own stormwater generation is important. So shall we move on? Yes. If there aren't any additional comments on topography, um, yeah, let, let's move on. And we'll have time at the end too if other things come up. Um, so Nancy, I'll have you chat about the circulation now. <laughs> the circulation, the treatment recommendations here were to maintain the circulation patterns around the perimeter of the park. 
Uh, also retain the adequate soil volumes for large tree plantings between the sidewalk and the curb. Maintain those cardinal direction pathways beginning at the midpoints of the block and extending inward on the west, north, east sides of the park, and then maintain the diagonal pathways beginning at the corners of the block and extending inward. Um, and one of the things that uh, I think it came up at the city council meeting when we presented this plan uh, that there was a discussion, I believe the last time I was here in uh, 2018 for our most recent improvements to the park, there was a very long discussion among the commissioners of whether or not the pathway should be straight or curved, but they were in fact just a theoretical discussion. It wasn't based on um, inform historic information or at that time we didn't have the CLR. And as you look back at the um, periods, the um, uh, diagrams of those periods of significance, and we can pull that up at the end if you'd like to see, there are times when the pathways are straight. There are times when the pathways are wiggly. <laughs> I wouldn't say curved, I'd probably say wiggly, but there isn't, a, I, I think these cardinal direction and corner access points have remained. And then perhaps the degree of straightness or curved is, uh, uh, you know, how, how true we say to that um, is if the pathways have not been maintained in the exact location over time. So um, I'll, I'll turn it over uh, to Kat to talk just a little bit about the plan. Yeah, so kind of taking into consideration these recommendations, so the vision plan maintains then the circulation with these critical park entries at the cardinal directions of west, north, and east sides of the park, and then at each of the corners. And the circulation paths, they originate at seven locations, throughout the block and kind of go inward towards the center of the park, which maintains these diagonal pathways, these cardinal direction pathways. Um, and then the perimeter sidewalks are also maintained and the soil volumes between the curb and the sidewalk, which was noted in the cultural landscape report, will also be retained for large tree plantings to support those um, perimeter tree lines. <clears throat> So, you can probably see the the patterns a little bit better in the the plan view. You'll mm -hmm. see that that center access is a little bit off center, but it's actually directly aligned to the mid block crossing that happens on 300 south. So it shifted, but the other ones are exactly in the middle and then at the corners. Not this one. <laughs> I would definitely appreciate um, some comments or discussion on the circulation since it has been uh, historically a point of discussion. Well, I don't see any comments or information uh, gleaned from our wonderful friends who do the farmer's market here. And that is quite frankly, one of the major uses of this park. So sure. is it just I going can... to dis disappear? No, and you know, we did not, we have uh, an exhibit and we can um, provide that maybe at the end, I can pull it up uh, mm -hmm. where we did a study placing uh, 370 tents along these pathways. And actually the, um, the plaza is really designed to provide better um, set a better setting for, say, the food vendors so that they have a place for people to gather. And then it's related to that pavilion with people to gather under it. We met several times with uh, the farmer's market to work through those details. And I'd be happy to pull that up at the end, that study. We just, just didn't include it <laughs> no, because I it wasn't. I want to know that they're happy with the design. Because I believe that they're they they use this park more than anyone else, and it's very yeah. very important to downtown and and small business and and yes. whatever they say in my my mind goes. Yes, agreed, agreed. Right. Thank you. Yeah, great comment. 
I have a question on the circulation, or I guess more broadly, um, when, when we're doing kind of the corollary of this process with, with historic buildings, a lot of times, even if there's multiple um, dates of significance or a long period of significance, we'll essentially pick a time within that period of significance and we'll try to go back to that one specific time. Um, in, in this case, it feels like you're kind of pulling from different eras selectively and strategically, um, which it might it's probably good for supporting kind of the long term vision of the park. But I'm just wondering if there's ever a a discussion where you're like, maybe we should just bring this park back to 1945 or. What? Yeah, and I am not a, a historic uh, landscape historic landscape architect. However, um, we do, we've worked closely with Lara Bandera, who has done a number of the CLRs. And I think the thing that um, uh, di landscape differs from architecture in the sense that landscapes are always changing. And there might be a landscape which has such a strong and significant period of significance that has enough for integrity that we that that the treatment recommendations would be to go to emulate that period or restoration. So the primary treatment for Pioneer Park is rehabilitation, which says essentially do no harm and preserve the the elements of that remain. But there isn't, I would say, of those periods of significance, there was um, also not one that predominantly stood out from a design standpoint. There was, if anything, the notion of Americanization where the park was um, a symbol of um, gathering and assimilation and should be a public and vibrant place. And so maintaining it as a public park. And if you look to the recreation elements and how they have changed over time, have really been responsive to the needs of the needs and desires of the surrounding community. So I think the nature of landscapes are, it's a little bit harder to pick a specific point in time, depending on if, say, if this had been designed by a notable uh, architect that was celebrated and it was a primary value and there was a significant amount of historic fabric, I think something like restoration or rehabilitation might have been the goal. But in the absence of those things, um, rehabilitation is quite often um, the recommendation with a cultural landscape. Does that answer your question? Yeah, great, that was, that was good, thank you. Any other, shall we, uh, I'll, I'll look to the commissioners if they're ready to move on or, yes, I see a nod. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so uh, this treatment, a set of treatments is, is around vegetation, which uh, by all objective measures, the, the most uh, kind of the, the, the elements that have the most integrity and that remain from those initial times is the vegetation. Um, so uh, uh, related to that is um, minimizing use of inorganic or impermeable surfaces. So we would not want uh, Pioneer Park to be largely a plaza or a series of buildings or reduced in any size. We really wanna keep it as a soft green oasis. Maintain the use of mown lawn as a predominant ground cover. And again, it's that clean clipped look that you can provide visual access across the park. There has been times in the park where there is more, um, there has been more botanic uh, diversity and texture. And we do resurrect that a little bit um, not not in a uh, replicating of history, but just bringing back some botanic diversity because the the community would like to see that protect and manage the mature trees, and so that is uh, I think those 
especially the elms on the west side, they, I think, have been there since the beginning, the, their initial planting. And then you have that strong planting that defines uh, all four edges of the park. And then the scattered trees that go throughout the park and the very large canopy trees are important. Um, one of the recommendations is to create an update and a succession tree planting plan. And uh, I think that is probably, you know, tree succession is, is one of the most complex things to address in a landscape, as we know, with even um, uh, Liberty Park and some of those strong elements. And what do we do as those trees, trees go? Um, continue the use of a variety of shade trees and to every degree possible, maintain that existing American elms on the west perimeter. So I have, a have uh, yes. I have a question about the vegetation. Sure. Having lived in the neighborhood for 20 years and uh, been on at least 20 charrettes about this park and more mm -hmm. meetings than I could possibly ever imagine. Um, the neighborhood is um, condominiums and apartment buildings. Is there any discussion or game plan to possibly put in a community garden? You know, that did come up a number of times. Um, one of the things that uh, we have a great partner with Wasatch Community Gardens, and there is a uh, large community garden just two blocks from here, and they are actually going through an expansion. So, um, is it the one over by the, the Sun Trap? The gateway. Yeah, the gateway. So, there's a significant community garden right there already. And uh, I mean, I, I I wouldn't say it's not an option at all in the future. It could certainly be considered. I think Wasatch Community Gardens would um, explore that, but we did not have an application or an interest. And I think the idea for Pioneer Park was to really maximize the space for those active and passive uses. And I, um, on an uh, unrelated note, community gardens can work really well on small parcels that can't provide those recreation or public gathering amenities. And we are continuing to look for opportunities in the downtown area. Okay. Um, and I, I'm not sure if you covered this yet. I don't remember that. But when we're talking about vegetation, there's also the uh, knowledge that there's a springs here and there is water use here. And one of the plans here is for a splash um, pad. And I'm really concerned about water use, um, yeah. particularly future water use. And a splash pad sure. to me makes absolute no sense whatsoever. Um, and what what do the experts say about uh, making these springs visible and and this kind of water use? We do um, actually later in the presentation we talk specifically about an element to celebrate um, the fact that there were springs here and it's a it's a misting fountain. We do not have a splash pad proposed. Okay. So. If we let, let's show the the uh, that is actually the next section with compatible alterations, and we can talk more about that specifically because it is, um, I think the the issue of water use is is first and foremost on our minds. But the this proposed plan um, looks specifically at that vegetation, and Kat has a thought, few words on that. And, and these are um, local kind of plantings that use low water? So, so this plant, this tree, this is just the trees in the park mm -hmm. and it shows, um, oh, can you go to that tree plant? That, it shows uh, existing trees in dark green, proposed trees in the lighter green, and then uh, proposed uh, trees to be relocated. And I'll let uh, Kat um, describe that. And then we can look at the planting of the, the botanic areas at the, the bigger plan. Thank you. Yeah, awesome, thank you. Yeah, so in terms of trees and vegetation, um, this proposed plan maintains that large lawn with the shade scattered shade trees. 
Um, and it also, as we kind of talked about, and we'll go into a little bit more, is adding that biodiversity through the garden ribbon um, that we mentioned a little bit earlier. And this plan also um, went to lengths to minimize hardscape and impervious surface, as was recommended by the CLR. Um, and then this vision plan also builds upon the historic vegetative features in the park by, um, in terms of trees, limiting that tree, limiting tree removal wherever possible. And um, it, we will be retaining about 85% of the existing tree count, but we'll be adding in roughly 90 trees um, with this plan. So that'll increase the current canopy actually by about 20%. Um, and then this vision plan preserves and protects the trees along the perimeter with the exception of along 300 South. And those trees are very much younger. They're in poor condition. Um, but this design does propose a newly planted row along this streetscape to reinforce that spatial composition and restore that formal perimeter planting that Nancy mentioned earlier. Um, so that's kind of the plan for trees and vegetation for the vision plan. Um, so yeah, if you guys have any questions, comments, we would definitely welcome those at this point. <clears throat> And then and I'm, I'm just going to bring up the plan. Yeah, view pull really up the quick. plan, and we can um, talk about where sort of the uh, right here. So it's a little bit hard to read, but from that northeast corner, you can see some shaded areas, and some of this is, you know, we still need to define, um, and that will happen through design development. But from the northeast to the southeast, these kind of teal colored areas are the planting beds where the stormwater would be directed to and in those areas that are slightly depressed would be um, the gardens with water-wise plant material and regionally appropriate material. And they would be low, um, you know, not taller than 24 or 30 inches in, in height so that they add some spatial definition, but they still allow for those views across the park. Um, and then Kat mentioned the there's an area of pollinator gardens and something that we hear a lot from the community and how um, uh, there's an importance to have an ecological focus to our landscapes and then um, and a garden walk along that for southern inch. So it, um, does that answer your questions? Great. Any other thoughts um, on the vegetation and the uh, planting? Another thing to sort of keep in mind, the reason why uh, it's proposed to new, do new planting along 300 South is to also make, improve the environment where those trees are planted because we often see that they don't have enough room or the, um, the landscape is so compacted that it's really hard on the trees. And that corridor there is the most heavily used with the farmer's market. So if we can um, work out how that is staged and where those planting areas are so we can create an environment for healthy, mature trees, that is the goal for the project moving forward. Um, Let's, uh, if there's no more questions, we can go on to the compatible alterations. So, um, the compatible alterations and additions, um, the hallmark, so kind of going back to that hallmark of the Americanization period and the goal of bringing people together and incorporating new amenities and uses, um, we, we are looking at how do we, um, re-energize re the center of the park so that we can have something for everyone and uh, did extensive public engagement to uh, understand what the recreation needs are, security needs, gathering, food, um, a place to rest, and, and you'll see details about that. But um, the recommendations around compatible alterations and additions say that uh, the park should preserve the identified contributing cultural landscape features, which are largely the trees and the perimeter edges and those entrances. New construction should be done in a way that does not impair the remaining contributing 
landscape features, and you'll see that they are, um, you know, at a distance from those. Structures should be compatible in scale and massing with the historical architectural scales, but should not create a false history. And so here, um, that concept of avoiding false historicism, so not making something look historic when it's not. And, and in some ways, incorporating those contemporary features allows those historic elements to stand out even more. But what, um, could you kind of quickly, sorry to keep interrupting, but could you go over the historical features you're trying to protect? I mean, this was a fort and a cemetery, and I don't see any nod to history. You know, is, so, there, is there a plaque? Um, is there a walkway where we're going to learn about this? I mean, where this is historic. So how are we pointing that out? Sure. So the um, analysis of the existing conditions said that of the existing conditions, as I, uh, I, I said earlier, in terms of workmanship, setting, uh, materials, is those perimeter trees, the turf, the entrances to the park. And I think what makes Pioneer Park particularly challenging is that it is a landmark site for Salt Lake City, yet there is so little intact historic fabric that oftentimes we are grasping for straws to make something historic. And I think what the landscape cultural landscape report clearly identified is that there is this long, rich history. And one of the things we will do as we move forward is to look at those um, opportunities for interpretation and in telling that story. And I think our intent here was to go very slowly through these existing elements to present how the plan um respects those treatment recommendations that were made and how the the proposed elements um if they deviate from some idea of a historic past it's because they are new and they we do not want to make them look historic if they're not but we will think about how to tell the rich story of the park and kat and i even had a a long discussion with partners at the Utah uh, cultural and community engagement and ta started talking about what new and innovative ways can we layer the rich story of the park in here. But um, where do you have art, for example? Uh, in we do not have art specifically at this time. We are looking to um, the Arts Council and partners to have art incorporated. Um, and then uh, I think through the architecture or the detailing from the landscape architecture perspective, we can uh, do that. And if we can share some of these other elements with you on these compatible alterations, uh, that in terms of the pavilion, the structures, and the water feature, I think you'll see how there has been a, an artful approach to, to those elements. And one caveat is these are ideas that we are putting out there and they have yet to be fully um, determined in terms of look, materials, and feel. And I think we would welcome suggestions from this group on those elements. Well, just, just the indigenous community and the impact that you know this sure. has on them. Sure. Um, I, I and one of the it. things um, that we will be doing is having a archaeological uh, discovery plan. So anything that is disturbing the ground, we have someone available to to review anything that's found. Um, and then uh, I think we can go to the next slides. We'll share with you what's in the vision plan. And again, this is. This is a big picture vision with so many details to to still uh, work out. Yeah, and I, I think um, we'll touch on some of those things as well as we move through these. So um, keep those comments in mind because, yeah, we'll, we'll welcome those um, once we share these. So kind of uh, as Nancy's kind of mentioned throughout these the features that have been established in the CLR um, with integrity are the entrances and the perimeter trees are kind of what we focused on. And so the, this vision plan protects these elements 
as we've kind of gone through, but also aims to avoid that false historicism. Um, and that includes with the compatible alterations that we're proposing. And so the features and amenities that, that we are proposing have been determined um, through public engagement so far. And the architectural style and materialization of these features will all kind of be developed during the technical design um, phase and will be compatible as well with the recommendations in the cultural landscape report to like the greatest extent possible throughout that process as well. So um, now I just kind of want to walk you through some of the individual architectural architectural elements that we'll include in this vision plan. Um, and that's a pavilion, restroom and cafe with a ranger station, and then um, recreation amenities as well as the water feature that we kind of touched on earlier um are we bringing back, we bringing back um um restrooms that was uh, one of the number one uses of the park and for drugs yes we and are getting to that <laughs> so i'm gonna start um first with the pavilion and then we'll move on um, so each of these features that we're proposing, we've really emphasized them to be light and open on the landscape. So um, this new kind of signature pavilion kind of harkens back to the Bowery that was on site and will really act as a focal point for the park. Um, and it, it'll have an opportunity to um, host kind of mid to small to mid size events when utilizing the plaza um, on the north end or kind of larger scale events when facing the great lawn that's currently in place. And this pavilion, like I said, it's open, visually light, um, and the architectural style materialization of the plaza as well as the pavilion and associated furnishings, those will all be developed during the technical design um, and will be compatible with the CLR. So in like the first round of phases, um, the first phase of um, implementation will be brought back to the commission at that point. So um, I'm going to move then on to the restroom, cafe, and a park ranger station, which is another architectural element. Um, and so this plan proposes adding a state-of-the-art restroom with a contemporary design. Um, it will be located adjacent to the most active area of the park, which is near a proposed cafe. Um, a park ranger station to house our new park rangers, um, a program that's housed in public lands, um, as well as a plaza where the park amenities um, are kind of the most accessible and re remain visible to the majority of park users. Um, and so rather than one large building, this plan kind of proposes three smaller structures located near one another in order to minimize that visual impact on the landscape and to maintain that visual access across the park and those open sight lines. And the and one thing I would say here, if you don't mind me interjecting, is that there of uh, those three small buildings, one will be kind of the park ranger host, one will be the small restroom, and a third, something to do with food. And so this idea of clustering starts to address these um, specific needs of a restroom if we're going to have uh, activities and want to have people there for a while, and then the security issues. So that clustering of things um, uh, is, is a distinct approach with that. Thank you, Nancy. Awesome. And yeah, then finally, I'm going to go to this ecological elements and then we'll kind of open it up to some some additional comments and questions. Um, so this we kind of touched on the water feature, but um, the water feature was identified as a very important amenity by the public throughout the public oh. engagement and planning process. And um, the CLR kind of notes that this, as we mentioned, the freshwater springs drew Native Americans and pioneers to the site um, and the vision plan here proposes a misting feature to kind of honor those springs and make water visible. Um, and we're calling it the source. Um, but this is more of a like a sculptural feature. It does utilize misting at key times throughout the season to kind of add that water experience, but to absolutely be mindful of the arid climate in which we live um, and the increased frequency and of course the effects of the droughts that we're facing. So this misting feature kind of um, satisfies that desire for the water feature while also kind of recognizing uh, that cultural element uh, and will also provide a way to kind of bring back this element that has drawn people to the area really throughout history and kind of address it in an artful and contemporary way. Um, so those are kind of the 
the major architectural features that we're proposing in this vision plan. Um, and I imagine there'll be some input and comments and questions here. So I'd love to kind of, yeah, address those now and open, open the floor. <clears throat> Unless Nancy, if you have anything else to add as well, of course. No, I think, you know, I, th I think these elements where um, with the, the specific architectural elements are the ones that um, will add a great deal of character to the park and uh, the probably the dilemma or the philosophical question is what should they look and feel like? And if you were looking at um, sort of how the, the CLR has been uh, presented and you read the document, it would say essentially that there is nothing that really dictates how it should look and feel, but um, keep the scale in line, make sure that there's that visual access. And so I think if there are distinct recommendations about the materials or the, pro the approach that you think are within um, keeping of the stewardship, the, the stewardship of the site, but not um, kind of replicating history. I think that's where we uh, want to strike the right balance and would welcome feedback or comments related to that. I'm happy to start if and um, looking at the plan, I mean, pickleball, basketball, a dog park, I guess those seem like extremely 2022 forms of recreation space. <laughs> um, uh, but, uh, you know, in, in reading the CLR, I guess it, it, it illustrated that, you know, recreation activities have really changed dramatically. Yes. Um, even since the, you know, what you identified as the Americanization period. Um, and I think there has to be an expectation that those spaces are going to have to change to some other purpose in of the relatively near future. And I'm wondering how that would happen. Um, would you, you know, simply like remove the play surfaces? Um, is there a, a plan for that? Um, and so on and so forth. Like what, what happens when, you know, people don't play pickleball anymore? That's a perennial challenge in all our spaces. <laughs> And, you know, I think you're right. I mean, pickleball is, uh, it seems like it's uh, caught on fire and in and, and every space people want pickleball. It certainly has been a big push from uh, certain, from organizations in the city. Um, they see that as a, as a key element. Um, I think it's accepting that uh, those things change from time to time. And even with a, any recreation element, like a, a playground, we we plan for a 20 year replacement plan. So hopefully, you know, these uh, elements are are continue to be popular for that. But the whole heart of adding these recreation elements is providing what people want. And then, you know, it would require removing them uh, throughout the space, but even sort of sports court or tennis court need um, maintenance or replacement at least every two decades. And we have a lot that are much older than that, and we can kind of cobble it together. But generally, our assets across the city are, are probably far behind what they should be in terms of providing, you know, um, kind of well playable features. Um, and, and, you know, the dog park, there's a lot of argument here with the dog park because we have an existing one and it was requested by the community, but it wasn't really utilized. And I think people felt like it really wasn't amenitized enough and it in and of itself is not enough to draw people to the park. And so having um, a diversity of activities and, and I think essentially Kind of the concept of approaching Pioneer Park has really largely remained the same for the last 20 years or more, which is open up the center of the park and create a variety of options around the edges. And so, um, you know, these recreation elements are a pure departure from the historic, uh, but in some ways in keeping with the use as a urban park. Does that answer your question? 
It does, yeah. And the okay. um, you know expectation of a twenty year replacement period is is very helpful. I guess I, I wasn't aware that that was the you know specific duration you were planning for. So yeah. yeah. So so I I had a a question and and I was just wondering if there was any consideration for, and I'll I'll just use myself as an example. I, I've been you know, relocated here in Salt Lake and loved it. And I've been here for just under 30 years. And and I, I, I until until being on the commission here and hearing the reports about Pioneer Park, I never really knew the history of, of this park. And it was fascinating to hear the, you know, the, the, the multiple different generations of this park. And I was wondering if there was any consideration in, in the work that had been done to date that, that there would be some notion of describing that history, uh, you know, just from beginning to end about how how your park is changing. Uh, and this is this is the latest iteration iteration of, of how the park is being used. Was there any consideration to to include some kind of storytelling about this historic park? Yeah, I, I think that's a really great I think that that we hear again and again and again, uh, there was uh, a recent effort by the Utah, I'm going to get their name wrong, but the community and cultural engage or culture and community engagement. And they did a whole series of West, the West Side uh, stories. And uh, I think what the, the, the cultural landscape report is so specifically focused on the park itself and how it's changed over time and how to protect that integrity. And then the West side stories are much more expansive and tell and get deeper into um, all, the, all the people that came through. And I, and I think, um, you know, one of the, the examples we uh, talked about uh, with those folks yesterday was Regent street and how there was a branding uh, consultant and artist that looked at innovative ways to bring those stories to the site so that you would discover them. And I think we'd like to explore something like that. Mm -hmm. um, I would also, in multiple ways, just even making the this history available in different in different realms. And right now it's really at the inception of how, how do we relay this? I have a question, another couple of questions. Um, uh, one is, um, what, do we see in our vision that the Twilight Concert Series are going to come back to this area? And if so, um, do do concert? Have you met with uh, the major concert producers here to make sure that you're designing the the area for the stage and people to watch in the right way? Yeah, I don't know if Kat, do you have those uh, cross sections available? We could show them. So we we uh, let me pull them up. We we talked um, in our in our surveys, community surveys. We asked specifically about those kinds of things, and I think um, what we heard is, you know, people are interested in seeing events of up to around ten thousand people. They don't want to see another Beck concert. And I think the, the, the model that worked for Pioneer Park in the past with, with extremely large scale events, creating a place where everyone was welcome um, is not sustainable for, for the neighborhood. They can't, we can't do that you know, all the time. And so we're trying to think of how to create a park that can host events large and small and still feel comfortable. And um, we are planning uh, based on the community input that events would not exceed um, 10,000. Well, but adding like pickleball, yes, pickleball is hot, but what is the demographic for pickleball? It's senior citizens. So you're creating a new demographic for this park um, and it's been used now for concerts. So. I find uh -huh. it interesting and I don't know how well that would work. I had always thought that the center um, to keep eyes, one of the most important things about this park is to keep eyes on it 24 seven. So it doesn't become yeah. the major drug problem that it yeah. has been. And my thought was uh, in the winter, we'd have a larger ice rink and in the summer that ice rink would be a roller derby um, 
field for everybody. So it was being used 24 seven with a whole mm -hmm. lot of people with mm -hmm. their eyes on that. But I'm mm -hmm. not sure. It's really hard for me to tell what demographic you're going after. Like, ooh, let's just, we're going to go after everybody and everybody's going to love this. Or, hey, let's just go after senior citizens and, and white privileged people who live in, you know, half a million dollar condos around the park. Sure, sure. I also, I also, and, don't, I also don't see uh, one other thing, and I'll shut up after this. Um, <laughs> being a, being a, a differently abled person, I don't see anything that's welcoming to me uh, as a handicapped person, people in wheelchairs, um, what are we doing here for that? Um, I'm worried also that the bathrooms are going to be so small, um, they're not going to be able to handle the, yeah. the amount of people there. And the bathrooms were the worst drug dens that we had in the city for some time. So, yeah. Anywho, well, oh, my I questions. think, yeah, the park certainly has had its fair share of challenges. Um, I would say, you know, in terms of accessibility, uh, you know, I, I, we we strive to make things accessible for essentially that concept of eight to eighty that everyone needs to feel welcome and accessible and and things like that. In, in terms of you know sidewalk width and access will be done in the um, design development. Um, I think in terms of Kind of the recreation diversity and options there's also a lot to weigh in terms of you know cost to build cost to maintain you know appetite for the public and we're currently we're actively looking for programming partners that can put things on in the park and we would definitely tailor things to the degree that we have willing partners um pickleball um as opposed to if you were just looking at court sports we have tennis there currently and what i'm hurt what i hear is that there are a couple of people who play it at the lunch hour most days of the week with pickleball um we put in six pickleball courts at um fairmont park and they have transformed that site and people are going they are doing things in a destination to go play pickleball. It is a fast emerging sport. In, in, in contrast to tennis, it's something that anyone can enter and it's, they're welcome to come play, whether you're a beginner or an expert, it's just the culture of the sport. And we heard a great deal from the community that they wanted to see it. And I think if we can um, kind of, uh, 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 we, we spent a lot of time vetting sort of what we would propose in terms of recreation in the park. And then also, you know, the appetite in terms of water or maintenance or ability to, to manage something like a skating rink or a roller derby area. And I think there's a lot of things to balance and what we would really like to hear in this venue is you know, how we are stewarding this space as a historic landmark site and sharing with you kind of our ideas about how to address that and, and eager to hear feedback within that context. And the, the, what was it? The Tribune said it was going to be about $20 million was the potential budget. And the full, the yeah, the full cost of all the elements, including improvements to the street crossings are upwards of $20 million. It is a large sum for Salt Lake City as a, a historic investment in parks, but it is not different from the amount that urban parks and cities invest across the nation to create a vibrant downtown park. That is, and that, and actually the per square foot cost is lower than a lot of comparison parks and other urban areas. But there's a lot of feedback uh, from the West side and particularly West side city council members are saying, what about us? Right, and city council has the full prerogative to fund or not fund. We currently have a little over $3 million. We are hopeful to receive more. Uh, we see Pioneer Park as a park for everyone in the city. Uh, and also downtown uh, doubles or triples in size with workers who come downtown. And yeah. so we see this as a citywide investment, not just a neighborhood investment. Are there, uh, I think I would 
really, I would appreciate comments from sort of the, our, our approach to architecture moving forward from this group. Well, I can say one thing about the um, with that strange modern shade structure that you had. Yeah, <laughs> um, I am a, a staff on at Burning Man, and I'm a temple guardian. And I can tell you the one thing we always fear is the architect is going to design something really groovy, and then the rest of the population is going to see that as something they can climb on and jump on and jump off of. So. Uh, <laughs> I would say, make sure they can't get on it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I had the same, I had the same thought perhaps that, um, you know, when, if the city is going to manage this, I, I would suspect that their risk management people will look at this very keenly. But I, sure. I thought, uh, Nancy, when you first showed that, um, you know, there's got to be some very simple means to, to keep people from climbing and sliding and you know yeah. all of the risks that that happen and then the city's responsible sure. I, I, I would would think again i've used the term before i think the devil is in the details and yeah. you know in in the future that's that's going to have to be very carefully taken into consideration mm -hmm. is there concern by the members to take a contemporary approach i think not at all I, I'm not concerned personally, but speaking from experience on this commission, it's it's difficult to articulate the message to the public regarding product of its own time architecture and why that is important and mm -hmm. um, what that really means. Yeah, I agree. With, I agree with John, but I'd say that it would be much more appropriate to do a modern intervention there than try to do something historic that'll come across as, as twee or not even necessarily historic but traditional in its right. form which put an opinion on the value judgment would just look stupid yeah thank uh, you for I'd, that I'd, I'd like the way you're going with this okay certainly better than an old board reproduction <laughs> yeah. and i think you know, with, with, with this, um, uh, if I can remember the name of the park, there is a park that has a similar structure, which I, uh, perhaps I will uh, provide that link to, to the commission so you can see what this was somewhat modeled after, but the intent of the pavilion was really to portray something that was light on the landscape, contemporary in nature, and really provided that visual access. Um, we had, uh, I think uh, there might be on that vision plan, there are some small images that show the pavilion in a much more minimalistic way. It's a little bit hard to see. I don't know if it's, um, we can provide that, but much more almost Mies van der Rohe with, so, so there's a lot of different ways we can go uh, approach the architecture on that, but I'm happy to hear the commissioners are open to and actually uh, enthusiastic for a contemporary approach to architecture. Yeah, Nancy, there's a, a park in Paris on the north side of Paris. It's, oh, it's an old, old park in Paris. It, you might not realize is a fairly historic city, but uh -huh. they they did a. I was tongue in cheek, of course. Um, <laughs> they they did a beautiful modern intervention, a series of follies, in the okay. park. This is twenty some years ago. I think it's Parc de la Villette. And oh, just, I know exactly which one you're yeah, talking those, about. Yeah, those those red kind of constructivist yeah. things. Yeah. You know, and yeah. that look might be kind of dated now, but it, the concept. And you can yeah. move through the park from one to the other in the midst yeah. of normal park activity. So I, yeah. I think uh, what you're doing in this in this smaller setting here is it's still important to do something that is stunning and quite visual. Okay. Like yeah, the, and the I post. and I think also circling back to uh, uh, Bab's comment about you know where is the art and where is that expression and really looking at the architecture as an opportunity to provide um, 
the beauty and surprise uh, well, that it This is a park offer. that had a train sitting in the middle of it for a long, <laughs> long time. <laughs> a little Where did that train go? Have you have you got the train, Babs? No, I don't. I, I don't remember what happened to the it train. Was in the, it it was went to Ogden. Ogden. It went to Ogden. In Ogden. Yeah. That's right. Babs okay. wants okay. the train back over the pickle court. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Should we, we turn the train into the pavilion? Oh, maybe the restroom. Yes. I'm just well, teasing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> It's uh -huh. in a very it's very happy at the State Railroad Museum at Ogden Union Station. It doesn't need to go anywhere else. Oh, well, yeah. there you go. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. So oh, that, so the one thing uh, kind of just kind of the final comment I'll make on the architecture is that there's this idea that there is a pavilion um, a, a, that anchors the plaza that you know is is large enough that it could contain an event. Uh, a medium sized event there, there could be a stage uh, placed under it and the audience to the north of it and a very large event. You could have that stage underneath that pavilion and the audience in the field. So a variety of ways to stage it. And then we also have those 3 smaller structures right in the vicinity of that uh, shade structure or pavilion. So they're in close proximity. You get that nexus of activity, so um, there's a higher degree of comfort around those buildings and keeping them small reduces those hiding places and. Um, I think also, you know, another thing that contributes to that uh, visual permeability is opening up the center of the park, then if you have. Um, you have smaller areas which you need around those edges with it takes fewer people to create that critical mass of comfort and that's a kind of primary idea about the approach i think um i think that was cat was that all we wanted to cover on the this uh additions yeah. and alterations yeah, the only thing, um, if there, I would welcome any more comments. We just, I wanted to give you guys a little insight onto some next steps and future opportunities, but that's kind of where we'll tie it, on, tie it up then. So let me know if you guys have any more comments. Otherwise, I'd love to, yeah, share with you next steps. Thumbs up. Thumbs <laughs> down. Awesome. So currently, um, the city is reviewing our final public engagement window results that ended at the end of January, kind of checking in on the vision plan with the public. Um, and this also will allow us to prioritize elements for this first stick phase of construction for which we have funding right now. Nancy mentioned it's about 3 million. Um, and so future studies will kind of explore how to incorporate those historic interpretation elements on the site through the potential of like interpretive panels or installation of artwork or i mean a variety of other integrated strategies um so that's the next step and we'll use the information provided in the clr to kind of integrate this history and the story of pioneer park um, into the elements on site um and then in terms of next steps for the design we'll be beginning technical design it's scheduled to start this summer kind of continue throughout 2022 um and then feedback gathered from a most recent public engagement survey that solicited implementation priorities from the community will be considered um, for this phase development and then we'll work to refine the um, architectural design and the style, the materialization of the structures and all the amenities, the planting and tree species will be determined through that process as well. And then um, the exploration of these interpretive strategies. And then we'll work with the um, urban forestry division within public lands to kind of determine the health of all of the existing trees on the site um, and begin discussions to develop a tree succession plan for the park. Um, and then at a future date, we'll work to develop an archaeological discovery plan as well, which was a specific recommendation outlined in the cultural landscape report. Um, so those are kind of some of our next steps um, 
If you guys have any other feedback, comments, recommendations, materialization, style, interpretation, anything like that, <laughs> um, feel free to share those now. Otherwise, we'll come back once we have um, phase one implementation priorities determined and technical design for with an application. So that's kind of the next time we'll see you with uh, Pioneer sometime, Park. Sometime this fall, we'll be back in front of this group with, um, I guess, We'll work with the preservation team to see if a, an, a work session on preliminary preliminary design is is recommended. But certainly, um, at the very least, with a formal application for a major alteration to the park, based on some portion of what you saw today. And our our goal is to come forward with a acceptable and appropriate uh, application. So we would love um, any feedback that you guys have tonight that would kind of inform that, or if you have any concerns or anything, I think this is a great opportunity to share those before we come back. <clears throat> Very good. Commissioners, any comments? No, just saying not nice work. It's very helpful to see what you've, what you've been working on and how it's going. I, I Thank like you. It. Yeah, I, I would want to echo that. I, I think it's it's very thorough. I think this is the second or third time we've we've seen the iterations of, of this and I'm very, very appreciative. Uh, and if there's not any other comments, um, commissioners and, and everyone, I, I think uh, we've we've done accomplished the business set out before us this evening. And uh, unless there's any any uh, comments to the contrary, I, I think it's time to close this, this meeting. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. All right, Thank take you care much. then. Bye-bye.